so i would request you to please uh, go ahead and uh, uh, start with the uh, presentation okay uh, well it's nice to be with you i'm very happy that this topic is part of the series you know um, i understand that people are feeling almost paralyzed by the spread of this very lethal virus and you know as this uh, virus spreads focus is on trying to understand the virus you know trying to understand when um these lockdowns quarantines and so on will be minimized i understand that that's really where a lot of attention is and i think that's precisely the kind of distraction that the forces in um washington dc and in other capitals is precisely this distraction which has you know pushed them to tighten their policies regarding particularly iran and venezuela so i'm happy that there's a chance to at least explain what's happening um i want to start with the un uh, secretary general on the 23rd of march antonio guterres made a very important intervention he said on 23rd of march that there should be a global ceasefire in other words he said all wars that are currently being prosecuted must be ceased in order for the global uh, community the people of the world to put their really resources energy behind um, breaking the chain of infection and finding a way out of this particular predicament for the planet i thought this was a very mature and important statement of course you know there are shooting wars that are ongoing and the war in yemen is one of the most uh, heart sick wars because being prosecuted now 5 years the country already in deep famine already rent you know rent with disease um, you know corona would be i think uh, you know not any worse for what the situation is already in yemen so it's probably with places like yemen in mind although he didn't name specific was um because he is after all got to be the world's number one diplomat nonetheless he said let's have a ceasefire now as i said these are for shooting wars but there's another kind of war that has been ongoing since at least the 1950s and that's the war that we call the hybrid war this is a war that's everything often but shooting sometimes there's shooting but it's not necessarily a full scale military invasion not necessarily full scale aerial bombardment you know as yemen is experiencing at this time as iraq experienced punctually in the 1990s and then of course in the 2000s that is more like a shooting war you know what the libyans experienced in 2011 the hybrid war is much more subtle and therefore much more difficult to capture and i'm going to explain what the hybrid war is uh, just now and then i'll walk us quickly through the experiences of cuba iran and venezuela in that order and hopefully we'll come to understand that the secretary general's call for a ceasefire of all wars should apply not just to shooting wars but it should apply as well to the hybrid war the much more pernicious much more dangerous form of warfare so first what is the hybrid war you see it's interesting as technology has improved um you know as we moved into the 20th and then 21st century it became easier for governments to do certain things especially imperialist governments imperialist governments with a great deal of resources at their command it's been easier for them to do certain things than it was in the distant past for instance um let's take uh, one aspect of the hybrid war which is information warfare see when it comes to information warfare we very well know that the media houses of the west largely i think leashed by the us government the cia the state department you know we have ample evidence i've just finished a book which will come out in a few months called washington bullets and in this book i demonstrate how when it came to um cuba when it came to very many parts of the world vietnam the united states government particularly the cia put a lot of pressure on the private sector media houses for instance the new york times and so on to send correspondents 
uh, who were sympathetic to US aims, not only to send correspondence, but they suggested to them, if you send a correspondent who's not sympathetic, they'll get no access to anything. They will not be able to report at all. So through a series of mechanisms, the corporate media was in a sense tethered or leashed to the war aims or broadly the political aims of the United States government, of the core of the imperialist bloc. Information warfare means that you put out your view of the world and make sure it's seen as universal. I think this is very key. So I'm going to use the example here of Venezuela. You make sure you put out the view of the world that the Venezuelan revolution, the Bolivarian revolution since the late 1990s is essentially totalitarian or authoritarian. Um, it's interesting to look at the Canadian media for this. Canada has about 70% of the world's mining companies headquartered there. Mining companies have had a great interest in countries like Venezuela, not only for oil, but uranium and a series of other important rare earth minerals and so on. Uh, Mr. Musk, uh, who, not Musk, uh, what's his name? Monk, Mr. Monk, sorry, not Elon Musk. Uh, his time comes later. Uh, Mr. Monk, who owned or was the principal owner of Canada's most prestigious mining company, Barrick Gold, um, wrote an uh, interesting and almost off the charts letter in the Toronto Mail and Guardian against Hugo Chavez, accusing Chavez of being a dictator. Now, why was he accusing Chavez of being a dictator? Because Chavez had put in place a law in Venezuela that allowed for the democratic utilization of all hydrocarbon material and other precious resources under the Venezuelan soil. This went against the freedom of Barrick Gold to exploit Venezuela. So Barrick Gold's chairperson starts to portray Hugo Chavez as authoritarian. This is information warfare. You know, they over and over systematically will say he's a dictator, he's a dictator, strong man, etc., etc. That's the information warfare part of um, this, you know, a hybrid war. Then there's a diplomatic warfare. You know, let's remove Venezuela from the Organization of American States. Let's remove Venezuela from the IMF. Let's remove Venezuela from, you know, uh, the UN. Let's take away the UN seat of the Syrian government. You know, this happened during the war in Syria. Let's, in a sense, delegitimize the government diplomatically. This diplomatic uh, warfare is another aspect of the hybrid war. Then there is the economic aspect of the hybrid war. Let's first uh, tell private companies not to do business with the country, you know, just stop doing business with them. I remember when um, Evo Morales government first in Bolivia decided to democratize their resources. I remember meeting a hydrocarbons executive in New York City, and he told me, frankly, he said, we'll leave all that precious stuff under the ground until we get rid of Mr. Morales. Very frank, you know, we're just going to boycott the country. Well, that's the first stage of the economic warfare. Then you go deeper, you start, you know, putting sanctions on the country. You make it hard for the country to do business. You start crippling the economy of the country. You remove the country from international financial network, networks. Because of the dollar Wall Street complex, you say that you can't use the US dollar. Any company that trades with Venezuela, which is going to trade with the United States, it will face secondary sanctions and so on. So economic warfare is the third aspect of the hybrid war. I mean, I can go on, there are many aspects, but I do want to quickly touch on two more. One is there are sabotage operations. Now, these are of course much more controversial because they're you know, not easy to prove, but we know from a long history of intelligence operations that sabotage is basically a normal fact of life. In January 2009, by the way, don't worry, I wash my hands, so when I touch my face, it's okay. Um, in January 2019, when the United States tried to overthrow the government of Nicolas Maduro, um, right afterwards, there was an attack on the electrical system in Venezuela. You know, pure case of, um, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, sabotage using the internet. I mean, using uh, the, the sort of web systems. I don't know anything about engineering, but I've read enough to understand that it's a plausible thing that occurred. We know, for instance, that in Iran, um, nuclear scientists were assassinated about 10 years ago. There were about four or five of them in Tehran, some of them driving in their cars. Somebody drives by on a motorcycle, 
motorcycle, puts a limpet mine against the car, drives off, the car explodes. There was direct sabotage uh, in the country. So that's a form of the hybrid war. And finally, form of the hybrid war is, of course, um, assassination of, of leaders of these countries. You know, we've seen this uh, from a very long time, you know, the assassination of Patrice Lumumba in 1961, um, and onward, Thomas Sankara in 1987, you know, assassinations of leaders of these um, national liberation movements, leaders in countries where their resource nationalism was on resource socialism was seen as utterly uh, incompatible with the needs of, um, you know, multinational cooperation. So this form of assassination we know is something that uh, is on the cards they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro, I don't know, 100 times. There was, of course, uh, what very clearly was an uh, attempt on the life of President Nicolas Maduro with a drone. Uh, now, again, hard to prove who put the drone up there, what was it doing, who tried to fire it, and so on. But nonetheless, that was an assassination attempt. Um, it's part of a long history. And so the hybrid war is a form of warfare. And when Secretary General Gutierrez says, let's have a ceasefire of warfare, I think it's fair. Now let's quickly look at these three countries. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on them. Cuba, 1959, has a revolution, overthrows a very nasty government led by Batista. The Castro government coming far extraordinary. We print this book for a long time. It's Moray's The Second Revolution in Cuba. If you can find it somewhere, I recommend you read it. Uh, Moray was an American professor who moved to Cuba after the revolution and he tracked the first five or six years in great detail. He shows you in this book that the Cuban government essentially was a resource socialist government. They said that, look, you know, you have these American companies, we're going to expropriate your assets, but we're going to pay for them. And the way we're going to pay for them is by uh, making sure you now uh, give Cuba back money that you mispriced. You know, you'd stolen all this money, so you've stolen the money, you're not going to put it back, so we're going to take your assets. And secondly, um, you know, if you want to buy sugar and continue business, we're ready for business. The embargo of Cuba came because Castro essentially was bringing reason into the world. He was saying that the people of Cuba should have the right to uh, their resources. It's resource socialism, effectively. Well, the embargo came and then the Cuban government, you know, this is one of the great treasures of the Cuban experience. And I very much hope that you come to understand this, you know, in a, um, almost in a, um, in a neurological way, you know, not just political. This is one of the great treasures of the Cuban government. The Cuban government, after the revolution, after the attempted attack on Cuba in the Bay of Pigs in 1961-62, that long period of sustained various attacks, you know, mining of the harbor and so on. After that period, the Cuban government, and I think the Cuban revolution in general, decided to arm the people, you know, not put a huge amount of the people's surplus into building a military force, creating a garrison state. They armed the people. They said, let the revolution defend itself. Instead of putting social surplus, which was precious in Cuba, because it, you know, it was a, a colonized country, with very precious resources. Instead of putting the surplus into the military side of things, we're going to fund education, we're going to fund health. It's so essential that you understand this. You know, every time I meet a Cuban of all kinds of backgrounds, I find them to be deeply intellectual people because they've had decades of high quality education provided for them, even in the special period when things did deteriorate as a consequence of the collapse of the USSR, which provided an immense amount of support for Cuba. In that special period as well, they tried their best to maintain, even though there was deterioration of the um, educational system. Health, it's extraordinary. You know, Cuban doctors always going abroad. Um, we have to pay attention not only to Cuban doctors going abroad, but also Cuban pharmaceutical companies developing indigenous forms of medication, Cuban chemical companies developing various forms of non-toxic fertilizer and so on. Cuba, under blockade, has refused the terms of the blockade. You know, this is something you really need to pay attention to. Cuba has never accepted the blockade. It's refused the terms of the blockade. It's fought to break the blockade since the 1960s. And it has not allowed American imperialism in particular 
to shape the character of the Cuban revolution. You know, because of the sustained attack on Cuba, it could have so easily become a garrison state, made the military the most important institution and so on. It didn't do that. And that's to the credit of the character of the Cuban revolution, but also of the Cuban people. Now, with Iran and Venezuela, the story is different because the attack takes place at a much later stage, not in the middle of the Cold War, but after the Union had collapsed. You know, Iran and Venezuela were both vital U.S. allies. Um, Iran was a vital ally in the Central Treaty Organization that the United States set up in the 1950s to encircle the USSR. And Venezuela was a vital U.S. ally in South America. You know, Venezuela and Colombia played this role, um, very, very uh, important role, um, you know, for the United States, you know, especially stabilizing oil. Iran and Venezuela played a big role. Even though Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia and so on were in OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exploiting State Countries, even though OPEC had an independent attitude towards oil markets in this period, nonetheless, Iran and Venezuela until um, the post-Soviet uh, collapse was relatively contained. You know, one was basically a U.S. ally, Venezuela. Iran was a U.S. ally until 1979, the revolution. But it was contained by in the Saudi push for Saddam Hussein's Iraq to attack Iran. It was contained till 1988. And then, of course, the Soviet Union collapses. Well, after the Soviet Union collapses, new developments come in both Iran and in Venezuela. Iran begins to have a regional perspective. You know, after the war ends, uh, particularly after the United States overthrows Saddam Hussein's government in Iraq and the Taliban in Afghanistan on two borders of Iran, Iran was hemmed in by its historical adversaries. The United States, uh, in the irony of history, takes out Iran's adversaries. And then Iran begins to have a regional perspective, at which point Saudi Arabia and Israel say, send Iran back to its borders. It's a regional threat. This is when they start to construct Iran as a regional threat. It's, it's at a time when Iran begins to have its regional linkages with Syria, with the Lebanese uh, political organization Hezbollah, uh, and out into North Africa. Uh, it has to be pushed back into its borders. And then out of nowhere, the United States and its allies fabricate the issue that Iran is building a nuclear weapon. This is out of nowhere. I don't have time to get into this, but the sanctions begin and the sanctions deepen and they hurt Iran deeply. Um, they, even though Iran has a domestic pharmaceutical industry, even though Iran has an immensely good uh, medical system, it was deeply hurt and penalized by the sanctions regime. Sanctions regime comes to um, Venezuela after Hugo Chavez comes to win an, his first election, and after a series of elections, Venezuelan people went to the ballot repeatedly You know, in the 2000s, uh, after a long process of them trying to consolidate the revolution, the United States puts deeper and deeper sanctions against Venezuela, trying to cut both Iran and Venezuela off from the world economic system and so on. I'm just going to tell you three points about the sanctions that are diabolical, particularly in this case. And then, you know, I'm going to wrap it up and we can have some discussion. What are the three points? Um, the first thing. So you have a sanctions regime against Iran, which was supposedly undone by the nuclear deal um, that the Europeans um, uh, pushed with the United States, to some extent the United States, but really it was a European deal. You know, Europe is stuck because in the course of just a few years, as a result of US imperialism, Europe lost its three main sources of energy. One, with the very criminal war against Libya, they lost oil from Libya. Uh, substantially, they lost oil from Libya. Secondly, as a consequence of uh, the conflict in Ukraine and the sanctions on Russia, they lost substantially energy from Russia, particularly the pipeline that was to be built to bring national, natural gas into Europe from Russia. And thirdly, as a consequence of this ludicrous sanctions regime on Iran, they lost energy from Iran. So Europe lost its three main sources of energy because essentially it backed to the hilt U.S. imperial power. You know, too bad, Europe. If you're going to be the tail behind the American dog, in this case, you're going to suffer. And that's precisely what happened. But Europe pushed for the nuclear deal because it's actually desperate for energy. It's, it's that. It's not that Europeans are more diplomatic. Please don't misunderstand the European predicament. They only pretend to be diplomatic. They're pretty ruthless, as you saw in the case of Libya. 
Nonetheless, they did push this deal. Trump, of course, reneged the deal and Iran found itself in much deeper sanctions than previously. These are criminal unilateral sanctions, not UN sanctions, although that doesn't excuse anything. But these are essentially American-driven sanctions. Venezuela, the sanctions were tightened after 2017. Again, as a consequence of Trump and the gangsters around him at the time, John Bolton, now still Mike Pompeo, the criminal of and others pushing for regime change, desperate to get revenge in Venezuela. They deepened the sanctions in 2017. Now, this is one country, the United States, but if you don't understand imperialism, you don't understand how US unilateral sanctions can hurt a country. Well, the United States says medical products are, have exceptions in the sanctions regime. Okay, that's nice on a piece of paper. How are you going to buy the medical products? How are you going to pay for them? How are you going to transport them into your country? These are fundamental questions that the United States, I think, quite deliberately elides, deliberately sets aside. Neither can Venezuela nor Iran pay for anything that they import. What am I saying? Firstly, the United States government has interestingly sequestered, and so has the Bank of London, Venezuela's own assets, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, U.S. dollars of Venezuelan money has been held by the U.S. government and not allowed to be used by the Venezuelan government. In fact, the International Monetary Fund has a corpus called the Special Drawing Rights, a way it's a kind of currency, international currency. The Venezuelan government has not been allowed to access hundreds of millions of dollars of its own special drawing rights, which are sitting in Washington, D.C. at the International Monetary Fund. So you're not allowing them to access their own money. You're not allowing them to use financial systems which you control. This is a very key part of US imperialism. It's what we might in shorthand call the dollar Wall Street complex. You know, by the dollar being essentially, you know, more than 50% of international trade in dollars, it's fiat currency. And then of course, Wall Street and the tentacles of Wall Street, the way money moves around the world through these unilateral crypto sanctions, banks are not really happy to transact or do business with Venezuelan firms or do any kind of trade with Venezuela. Banks are scared because they will face secondary sanctions. So then you cut off these countries essentially from financial markets. In Europe, there is a wire transfer system called the SWIFT network uh, based in Brussels. This is a key. You know, Some of you may know when you send a wire, you have to get a SWIFT code. This is a Brussels-based um, institution. Now, Iran and Venezuela out of the SWIFT network. They can't use the network because SWIFT is worried it will get sanctions by the United States. So neither can Iran nor can Venezuela essentially interact with the financial markets, do commerce, basic commerce in the world. That's the one point. Secondly, the United States government has suggested that any transaction with the governments of Iran and the government of Venezuela is a violation of their sanctions regime. Now, here's the problem. Uh, both Iran and Venezuela, like many countries in the world, their working classes, their peasantries and so on, don't access private medical care. They access the public sector medical care. That means state medical care. That means the state medical care system, which provides the bulk of medical care in Iran and Venezuela, required to buy supplies of different kinds from abroad. That means the Venezuelan and Iranian state effectively are buying supplies. But because of the very harsh sanctions against the public sector, against the state, the these, you know, United States can say, but private hospital could buy things. Well, yes, but now you're, because through sanctions, you're pushing for privatization effectively, but it's not going to happen. There's no real private sector hospitals in Iran that are going to emerge suddenly. By penalizing the state, you're penalizing public health. And this is the issue that needs to be made much more of. Uh, the final point I want to make here is about you know, how to bring in goods. How do you even bring goods into these countries? Airplanes don't want to fly. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a piece you can read at the People's Dispatch website called Sanctions Against Iran and Venezuela During a Pandemic Are Cruel. Uh, it was written by Paula Estrada and myself. And in it, we quote from the World Health Organization officials who had supplies in the United Arab Emirates ready to fly into Iran, 
but they had they said they had flight difficulties because airlines didn't want to bring those supplies into um, iran the emir uh, in uh, you in the, the, the i think the one of the emirs of dubai or whatever um, you know felt that this was unfair he felt personally that this was unfair even though they have a hostile relationship with iran they allowed uae military planes emirati military planes to fly the supplies into iran it's hard to get supplies into these countries because you can't get commercial flights so you'll need military flights you know you need the russian air force to come in you'll need chinese military planes or state planes to come in you can't get commercial flights so the sanctions regime continuing and deepen has actually hurt these countries medical systems and made it difficult in iran grotesquely because they faced this greatly um, you know they felt faced covid 19 already greatly it's hurt them this doesn't stop united states this is the last thing i'm going to say united states had then made a hallucinatory accusation against the government of venezuela you know william barr the, uh, the attorney general of the united states held a press conference in the middle of this crisis accusing nicolas maduro of being a narco trafficker indicting him of narco trafficking united states has moved a carrier group of warships off the coast of venezuela because they say we want to protect you know the country from narco trafficking well the um, drug enforcement agency of the united states government in all its last 5 6 reports says that basically 90% of cocaine that comes from south america into the united states comes from colombia not from venezuela the only place venezuela enters the drug enforcement agency reports is when they say that the colombian drug traffickers sometimes bring the cocaine into venezuela and hide it in remote locations and then transship it through central america mexico and so on into the united states there's no mention in these reports of any venezuelan involvement secondly the um, president of of uh, colombia ivan duque has himself been uh, you know uh, th there are questionable ties that he has with drug traffickers inside colombia colombian drug traffickers so this hallucinatory indictment has come against venezuela warships you know around venezuela trying to blockade the port strangling the country more this is the essence of hybrid war and there's almost virtually no challenge globally to this hallucination you know no country in the world has really come out and condemned the united states for playing these games in the middle of a global pandemic so you asked me to talk about the sanctions the embargoes the blockades in iran cuba venezuela but really the subject isn't that the real subject is us imperialism in a time of this pandemic it's a character of us imperialism and the hybrid war it continues to prosecute against so many parts of the world this is not a story about iran or venezuela or cuba the story of iran venezuela cuba is of people trying to bring reason into the world people trying to make decent lives without the boot of an external force on their neck that's what the story is but the story i told you is not a story about venezuelans and cubans and iranians this is a story about imperialism thanks a lot now so uh, thank you so much vijay uh, there are a lot of questions uh, which uh, first of all i would like to start from kevin uh, kevin is asking you a question that how do you see the effect effectiveness of us sanctions shifting after this covid-19 crisis we have seen reports of china overcoming or ignoring some of the sanctions placed on iran and venezuela italy joins the belt and road initiative it is clear they are playing a lar larger global leadership will we will we see more countries particularly europe defy us sanctions so i mean i i should say i hope so uh, that that's the first thing i would like to say that i hope that there's going to be a change but let's be frank these sorts of changes don't happen easily um the united states already is on a full scale ideological assault against china full scale um attempting to blame china for the virus uh, to shift any discussion from the real virus which was austerity in the west austerity pushed by the imf on countries of the third world and so on that's the real that should be the real subject here why is it that 
uh, socialist countries have been able to deal with this virus, break the chain faster. Not only socialist countries, but parts of countries like Kerala and India has been able to rationally approach the virus. Whereas, you know, countries battered by the IMF, battered by neo-fascism, they are spending their time lighting candles and beating, you know, plates in public and so on. Um, this should be a delegitimization of imperialism, of neoliberalism and so on. But unfortunately, not so directly because they are on a full-scale information war uh, against China um, to delegitimize the, to delegitimize reality in a sense. So let's not you know, underestimate what's going on. I think it's very important to distill the actual lessons of this rather than the distorted version being put forward by the corporate media and so on. If you look at the New York Times, it's on a full-scale war against China. If you look at the Wall Street Journal, they had an editorial yesterday, full-scale attack on China, how China is you know, basically taken over the WHO and so on. It's all based on fantasy. This distorted information um, warfare that they prosecute, that's going to be there. So we have to be very vigilant. You know, these changes don't come easily. Even the question of Italy and Belt and Road, you know, Belt and Road is going to be hurt in the short term um, because it's going to take time for uh, China to recover uh, trust, you know, against this information warfare. It's going to take time for China to be able to rebuild some of these um, pathways that it has. Uh, I think that uh, the, the future is not uh, dim at all. I don't mean that. But I don't think anything is going to be easy. I think it's going to be a very serious struggle. Um, I think the Chinese people are up to it, but it's not just the Chinese people. I think that's the key thing. I think the forces of socialism are up to it. Uh, I think that's how we need to understand this. This is not about China um, you know, becoming a major power. I think we should insist that it's about changes in the world. Yesterday, I talked to a very senior banker um, in uh, New York City. I spoke to them on a the telephone, and they asked me about modern monetary theory, uh, which is a kind of warmed over Keynesianism. And in it, uh, she told me that in their very big bank in New York, even the top executives are now of the view that the era of small government is over and that you know, dirigism or government intervention is back. And I was trying to suggest to her this is the revenge of Marxism and that it's not the era of big government back, but I think we need to talk about that the time of socialism has come. So uh, one question from one of our friends, uh, Burhan from Bangladesh. Uh, his question is the formation and philosophical and their ideological position of these countries are distinctive, particularly to the form of revolution. One is associated one is associated with religious revolution. In this case, it is very difficult to support all these countries and revolution in the same manner. What should be the ethical and ideological positioning as an ethical left activist? Should we consider it in the same way? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, the first thing I would say is, without a doubt, without question, you have to support the people of Iran, the people of Venezuela, the people of Cuba, Anybody who faces the gun of U.S. imperialism, imperialism of its allies, we support. You know, we, we support the people without a question. Uh, the people of Iran under this horrendous uh, sanctions regime, this blockade, deserve our full-throated support. This unequivocal, you know. Uh, just because I don't uh, have any uh, link to their form of government and so on, doesn't mean I don't fully support the people of Iran. I think that should be said directly. Of course, there are distinctions. Of course, the uh, government in, in Cuba is a you know, completely uh, socialist experiment. They've uh, moved and taught us a great deal through praxis about uh, the, the proper modes of moving through socialism and so on. We've learned a great deal from the experiment. You know, no, nobody, when you overthrow a nasty regime, you're not in paradise. You know, you're in a process. It's an experiment and the Cubans have taught us a lot. So I have very much different attitude towards, say, the Cuban revolution, the Bolivarian revolution, Venezuela, where, again, the experiments with socialism have been very instructive. You know, the way they have decentralized authority to working class people in communes, how they've created these missions to go out there and take care of very key deprivations of the public and so on. We've learned a lot from the experiments in Cuba and in Venezuela. In Iran, it's a slightly different thing because it's an openly, avowedly theocratic government. 
Now, I don't support a theocracy at all. I don't think that that's the way for uh, humanity to move forward. On the other hand, Iranian theocracy is interesting. Um, it is also rife with internal debates between, let's say, a socialist component and a neoliberal component, you know, or and also just a plain old liberal component. Inside the uh, ruling bloc in Iran, there are different political tendencies. So we shouldn't miss that, you know. It's a it's a kind of Islamophobic thing to see all the mullahs and call them mullahs. You know, that's a very wrong approach. There's no such thing as the mullahs, you know. They have very different and diverse political interests. And one has to enter into the concrete and see what those different interests are, how they are competing, you know, whether there is a capacity to move the agenda forward in Iran. Uh, I think that's how I see it. You know, first, we've got to defend the people unequivocally. And secondly, you can try to understand and learn what are the dynamics, political dynamics inside a society. I think that's a very key approach. So, um, uh, the other question is from uh, Laia. Uh, she has asked you a question that the government of Western countries are going to ne negotiate state pacts to manage the crisis. Though these pacts, they will obtain funding to help companies out of the national debt that the workers of the world will pay later, as usual. Social democracy was born with this pact for the First World War. Can we avoid it with a world pack of the workers' parties? Do we still have time to negotiate this new international for which Rosa Luxemburg died? Well, I mean, I'm fully sympathetic with everything that uh, she's, she's said. I mean, I'm fully sympathetic. Um, I would like people to go to our institute's website, thetricontinental.org, and maybe you can put the link in the chat. Um, in the website, on the website, there is a document uh, which we put together, declaration, with the International People's Assembly, which is a platform of 200 political organizations around the world, including the Communist Party of Nepal, Workers' Party of Bangladesh, Workers' Party of Tunisia, the Landless Workers' Movement in Brazil, and so on. 200 political organizations uh, distributed over 100 countries. The International Assembly of the Peoples and Tricontinental produced a declaration, a 16-point declaration, which is an open platform of discussion for left peoples around the world to endorse, to read, to discuss, to argue against, and so on. We need to build our own framework of how we would approach these crises. You know, the thing is that there are inter-capitalist rivalries that are uh, apparent even now. Um, there will be open rivalries between sections of the European experiment against each other. This has been happening already for a while. The European experiment, very fragile and probably won't last through this uh, epidemic. Um, I think the rivalries with China and the United States, these open up possibilities uh, for other platforms to emerge. And I think we need to be a little more aggressive in this time, um, you know, against this idea of using uh, trillions of dollars to essentially put a floor under a big capital so that they can preserve the value of their money. I think a lot of people around the world have come to understand that the evisceration, the destruction of healthcare infrastructure in the bourgeois parts of the world uh, is a nightmare. And they look at places like China where they were able to mobilize vast resources quickly to build hospitals, to bring in hundreds, thousands of medical personnel to come in, uh, to break the chain, uh, to, to take a very difficult and lethal virus and to contain it somehow. You know, we see that around the world. That's why the information warfare against China is so intense right now, because they don't want reality to be reported. They want a distortion out there. I think we need to be clear about that, that in the short term, certainly they have the advantage because subjectively, the forces of the left are not as strong as the forces of the right, as the forces of the neo-fascists and the capitalist bloc and so on. But nonetheless, the bourgeois order has decayed considerably and I think we need to be much more aggressive in pointing that out. So uh, we have Dr. Francisco Dominguez. Uh, he's, a, he, he's asking you a question, which is, um, you said something about decline of the US and its correlation with the current intense aggressiveness towards uh, uh, Venezuela. Uh, how do you see any chances of the US military going into Venezuela? Well, uh, Francisco Dominguez is a very, uh, you know, a uh, learned scholar of the region. And uh, it's hard for me to answer a question from, from him, but uh, let me give it a try. So it's, I'm, 
now a little embarrassed that he was listening to this. Uh, well, um, I actually don't think the United States government is going to enter Venezuela. In 1964, um, well, I'm sorry, I mean the United States military is not going to enter Venezuela directly. In 1964, when the US government was eager to overthrow the president of Brazil, uh, Juan Golat, um, the United States sent a carrier group from Aruba to sit off the coast of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, off the southern coast of Brazil, just sit there. Uh, Lincoln Gordon, the ambassador of the United States in, Venezuela, in Brazil at the time, was in touch with the Brazilian military. And what they essentially did was they put this carrier group, US carrier group offshore, uh, off the coast of Brazil, to send a message to the military that we will back you to the hill. And it's at that point that the military left the barracks and went and overthrew Gulat, and you had a dictatorship that lasted 21 years. I have a feeling that Elliot Abrahams, who knows his history very well, wants to put a US carrier group off the coast of Venezuela hoping against hope that elements of the Venezuelan military will decide to move against um, the government of Nicolas Maduro. It's already backfired because the right-wing politicians, including Capriles, Falcon, all these people inside Venezuela have attacked, condemned the U.S. warships entering. In fact, Falcon, who was the uh, presidential candidate against uh, uh, Nicolas Maduro in the last election, Falcon publicly said, that it would be better if the U.S. sent their ships with medical supplies rather than with weapons. I think this is very significant, that the times between 64 and now are changed. Venezuela is not isolated as the U.S. seems. Uh, Russian and Chinese support is coming in. Medical support is coming in. There's already Cuban support for Venezuela. I, I don't think they're going to be able to so easily, uh, as they haven't been able to since their very aggressive moves in January 2019. I don't think they're going to be able to overthrow this government. I think the fantasy of repeating Operation Brother Sam of 1964 against Brazil will not take place. That's my general sense that the Venezuelan military is not going to move against Nicolas Maduro, not only because they are loyal to the Bolivarian revolution, which I think is a very interesting feature of the Venezuelan military, but also because Capriles and Falcon and these other politicians have condemned uh, this approach. You know, they have said this is a Venezuelan process, we want to deal with it. Because they know that if they do come to power at the end of an American warship, they'll have no credibility either in their own countries, because the Bolivarian project has a great deal of support inside Venezuela. They'll have no credibility in their countries, and they'll have no credit, they'll be the laughing stock of South America, you know, like, like uh, so-called President Anies from Bolivia. You know, okay, she's a she's a laughing stock in South America. You know, nobody takes her seriously. She came to power at the front end of an American tank, essentially, and of you know uh, an electric tank, perhaps made by Elon Musk and 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 the General Dynamics Corporation. So, uh, but uh, there are there are many more questions, but we'll take uh, a few of them. Um, uh, Spencer is asking you that what can individuals do during this time of crisis to help re resist both the media attacks and the economic sanctions on the various targets like Cuba, Venezuela, Iran? You see, it depends where Spencer is located. I think that's important. If Spencer is located in the United States, I think it's extraordinarily important to join in um, struggles against the sanctions. I know that in the United States, there is Code Pink, uh, Women for Peace, very active in the anti-sanctions uh, campaign. Uh, there, is, there are various political parties, the Party for Socialism and Liberation and others that are very active in the anti-sanctions movement. You have to be involved in that. If you're in Canada, there's of course the Communist Party of Canada, various other platforms. If you're in Great Britain, uh, you know, there are platforms. I, I don't, it really depends where you are. I think more than anything else, we need to make a lot of noise. You know, we need to write more, we need to be in organizations, to be in an organizations, in an organization against uh, the cruelty, the human rights violation of this sanctions is essential. Um, before COVID-19, the Iranians, the Venezuelans, and about 50 countries were creating an anti-sanctions block, you know, uh, in the non-aligned movement. I think that's a very productive direction. I hope very much that when things uh, in, of this virus begin to slow down, that this block will get uh, you know, properly produced by the Venezuelans, Iranians, Cubans, and others. 
I hope other countries will be put under pressure to join it. You know, India, shameful, shameful India, a terrible policy regarding these countries, no public statement denouncing um, this criminal regime against Iran. You know, India and Iran have such a long history together, an old history. Um, for uh, the important period of the 1990s, when Iran started feeling the heat, India came on Iran's side. And then in order to become a nuclear ally of the United States, India betrayed Iran. It's shameful. There must be pressure put on the Indian government uh, to make statements against the sanctions. To you know, Perhaps if, if the Indian government, which is not actually doing enough for its own people, sending millions of people to walk home and so on, the Indian government can send supplies to other countries out of, out of India. Why doesn't it send just one plane of supplies to Iran? I think that's something that people in India should push for. To send one flight of supplies to Iran. An act of immense solidarity with the Iranian people. Uh, does this government have the guts to do it? No, it doesn't. It, it's completely servile to the United States. Uh, Sobin is asking you that, do you think that the Indian left uh, has less been concerned about imperialism in the recent years? Well, I don't know if the Indian left has been concerned less about imperialism than before, but I would like to say something perhaps out of turn. But I do feel like the international left needs to learn something from the Cubans. We need to learn a lesson about internationalism. You know, anytime anything happens of tragedy in the world, whether it's Ebola in Western Africa or it's the earthquake in Pakistan, the Cubans always ask, can we send five people? Can we send eight doctors? Can we send medical professionals? Can we send supplies and so on? Cuba, under immense sanctions, nonetheless, always sends a message. Can we come and assist? During the earthquake in Pakistan, Cuban doctors arrived. I don't understand why we as a left, international left, don't have this as a common practice. You know, why in from India we don't send three doctors somewhere, you know, even if it's just three or five people, you know, why is it that the Canadian left is not capable of sending 10 doctors, you know, uh, to Iran to help assist the Iranians? Uh, this is an act of immense solidarity. You know, you, we don't you, you miss the point if you think, oh, we need to send a thousand people or whatever. Send a few people that will never be forgotten. You know, how do we build internationalism? It's not just a statement of solidarity. It's by acts of breaking embargoes, by going to places, by offering expertise, and so on. And I, I really feel like the international left needs to learn this lesson from the Cubans. You know, nobody has been so suffocated, or nobody, no country has felt the attempt to suffocate it uh, as the Cubans have felt. And yet they've refused to be suffocated. You know, they are the most international looking people. They didn't close themselves in and say, we'll just you know, inside the embargo make our revolution. They said, no, the world is ours. Castro so many times used to say, Cuba is not the name of this island. Cuba is the name of the world. So uh, I think we'll take uh, last three questions. Uh, I know uh, there are a lot of questions, but uh, we'll limit this to uh, last three questions. So uh, one of the questions is, how can sanctions affect the people's attitude towards their states, specifically in Iran? We recently saw huge numbers of people in riots asking for the Iranian system to be overthrown. Well, I mean, this is the purpose of sanctions. I mean, why does the imperialist bloc do sanctions? They put sanctions on a country to make the situation in the country so miserable that people will rise up. I mean, that's effectively their technique. That's the basic strategy. And in Iran, there have been, you know, series of different kinds of, of dissatisfaction that people have felt saying, oh my God, we, we can't survive in this situation. We need to have um, a better you know, dispensation or, or it's the Iranian government's obstinacy that's preventing us from living. That's exactly the kind of information warfare that the imperialists push, that they say, we're going to give you, we're going to do sanctions on you, but the reason you have sanctions is because of your government. You see, they will defer the blame for sanctions onto the government. Recently, the United States government made a mafia-like um, uh, proposal to the Venezuelans. They said, Maduro steps down, the puppet Juan Guaido takes away his claim to the presidency, and then we'll create a transitional government, you know, but brokered by the United States. Again, I was very pleased to see Falcon, Capriles, all these Venezuelan right-wing politicians rejecting that because they know it's a totally illegitimate thing. But what they are saying is, 
if Maduro goes, we'll remove the sanctions. Then there's pressure inside the country. People are, they don't have insulin. They don't have this, they don't have that. They say, okay, maybe we should do this. It's a mafia technique, you know? So, I mean, one shouldn't fall for a mafia technique. If I say, look, I'm, I, I have some differences with the theocratic government in Iran. I don't think that the lever of imperialism should be mobilized to overthrow a government like that. You know, I think that the government matures, that inside the country there will be uh, new developments, new political views and so on. You can't just overthrow the government from on top with backing of imperialism. There was a left-wing view, quite a scandalous view, that went from Iraq to Syria, to Libya and onward. And what this left-wing view said was that Saddam Hussein is a fascist, therefore uh, it's okay to support imperialism against him. That was the view, for instance, of Fred Halliday, a very prominent professor in Great Britain, left-wing Marxist professor. People said this about Syria, you know, particularly the far left bloc said, well, you know, let's get rid of uh, Assad in Syria. Well, we therefore support imperialism or we support imperialism against uh, Libya. We heard this from people, you know, who are uh, in the uh, sort of Trotsky kind of, uh, you know, uh, platforms and so on. I don't take those things seriously because they seem to believe that it's okay to ride on an American plane and they think, well, afterwards you'll have a socialist revolution. They are, they are on Mars. If you don't have the support of the people, you're going to have a military leader, you're going to have some fascistic dictator come in and so on. Look at the situation in Libya today. It should give people pause. You cannot bring socialism by allowing a country to be aerial bombed by the imperialists. That should be a, a theorem that I hope people accept. Uh, you cannot bring socialism to a country after aerial bombardment by the imperialists. I mean, that's a very clear thing. So that's off the table for us. Uh, Shajni is asking you, do you see opportunities emerging from this pandemic to reconstruct a more just global governance or where empire is being, being disempowered? Well, you know, look, uh, they, I think what's going to happen is that the neoliberal consensus is going to be put aside. I think we are going to return to the era where capitalist states, the bourgeois order, is going to understand that there is a requirement for more state intervention. That means they're going to ask for the rich to pay slightly more in taxes and so on. We're going to move from, you know, there was a kind of Keynesianist consensus in the period until the 1970s. Then you had this deep 50-year phase of neoliberalism, cuts, no taxes for the rich and so on. Basically a fool's banquet of 50 years. And now we may shift back to that Keynesian-esque consensus. It's not necessarily socialism. I would caution you. The collapse of neoliberalism doesn't inaugurate automatically uh, entry into socialism. Big government for the right doesn't mean public action, doesn't mean public control of institutions, doesn't mean all the elements of socialism. A big government can mean big government for big business. You know, what we're going to see, and it's already clear, is there'll be much more consolidation. You know, small shops are closing down in this long period of economic trials. Big businesses are getting a lot of the cash from reserve banks and central banks. Big businesses are going to consolidate. You know, in many cities around the world, you're going to stop seeing small shops. You're going to see more chain grocery stores, you know, because they'll survive the economic crisis. Instead of small family restaurants, you're going to see more chains, you know. Some of the chains will create fabricated family restaurants that look like family restaurants. More platform, uh, you know, platform capitalism is going to dominate. We're going to have much more use of, you know, app-based buying, whether it's Amazon or the Ubers or Lyfts or whatever they are. This platform capitalism will deepen. In other words, centralization of capital is going to hasten at the same time as they'll call for big government. So I don't think we should believe that the fraying of neoliberalism is going to lead to socialism. It might very well lead to a much more centralized form of domination by platform capitalism. You know, these big platform houses, which are now making a lot of money, you know, the Amazons and so on, they're going to expand, they're going to deepen their tentacles in social life. The question that will be raised is what happens to mass unemployment, underemployment, basically structural unemployment. So they are going to accept some form of watered down universal basic income to make sure that there's no uprising. A watered down universal basic income is not socialism. So we got to be clear that we're entering a new phase of struggles. We're not entering close to where 
the advantage is on our side uh, there are a lot of uh, very interesting uh, uh, questions but uh, i know you also have, have to go and uh, take a class so maybe uh, i'll just limit it to i know this was a, this was going to be a last question but i'll take like Say two more questions. Okay. So uh, it's uh, one one of the questions is like, what do you think that the situation of COVID nineteen will strengthen the far right wing in the world? Well, that's actually a great. Is that the last question, Atul? No, uh, this is the second last. I'm going to take. What's the last question? Give me both of them, then I'll pick which one to end with. Okay, so uh, I think I'm I'm jumping uh, to someone from Pakistan who asked you that question. How do you see South Asia in post corona world? This is from okay. the student of Marxism from Pakistan. So I thought good. I'll let's take that. do the South Asia one and then do the neo fascism. Neo fascism one is a good way to end this, I think. Okay. 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 So let's do the the Pak the South Asia. I mean, honestly, we don't yet know what impact um, this virus is going to have in South Asia. We don't yet know. Uh, we had the first few cases in Dharavi, which is the world's largest oppressed. neighborhood in the world you know uh, i think just the first few cases there uh, we don't know i mean we don't know if all this thali banging and and pataka bursting is going to you know scare away the demon of covid 19 you know uh, this is a form of magical thinking but maybe it succeeds i'm a i'm a scientific minded person this is the world's largest experiment in hallucination maybe it will succeed but i don't think so i think this is going to have quite a big impact uh, the literature is telling us that warm weather is not necessarily an immunization um, you know it, it's not the case that indians uh, because we have so many parasites and so on you know digestive tract uh, illnesses from our childhood jadia you know malaria even not digestive tract but malaria and so on that we've developed enormous antibodies i don't think that's the case uh when the spanish flu or the influenza of 1918 came to india it devastated uh, particularly gujarat 60% of global mortality for the influenza epidemic took place in india in greater india british india um that is to say not only in gujarat in sindh and so on a very uh, enormous casualty rate and that was also an avian virus so we don't know what's going to happen i mean i very much hope and i very much uh, feel and this is going to relate to the last question i very much hope and feel that um we are able to not allow jingoism um to define uh, the virus i mean in india already there is a very much growing anti chinese sentiment it's there deeply in the united states and canada and western europe and so on but it's growing in india and it's a very disturbing development um it, they're also communalizing uh the virus in india you know there was a, a tablighi jamaat gathering in nizamuddin in delhi and people said well it was a transmitter of the thing you know so you can well see that there, there was a fellow in chennai book for making communal statements about uh he was booked by the police for making communal statements about the virus you know making ridiculous sectarian statements about the, this is this is all dangerous we have to resist jingoism you know it's our duty as socialists you know it's not just our duty as socialists to push a socialist agenda it's our duty as socialists to push also the rights of human beings and reason you know we got to push for reason and a, a society the right wing knows this society where unreason is promoted superstition is promoted is a society that has a hard time accepting a socialist framework the more superstition the less the ability of that society to go for Uh, socialism that's why it's so important to have a rationalist movement it's so important to push for uh, a rational understanding scientific understanding of events including you know this virus so i very much hope that in pakistan in india in bangladesh across the region uh, we're not only uh, you know doing our best to provide mutual aid to people as a left and so on which i know that uh, the cpim in india is very much involved in mutual aid uh the mass organizations the tyfi sfi etc very involved in mutual aid it's it's absolutely essential yes all of that um you know we know that from the center for of indian trade unions uh, which organized the asha workers the public health workers 990000 public health workers in india almost 100% of them women extraordinarily underpaid they get their salaries held often 
the conditions are bad they are going house to house in india offer no masks no protective equipment no hand sanitizing brutalized labor working conditions are terrible of course we have to be there making those claims but also claims of reason you know got to have a scientific understanding you know it's not correct to create jingoism anti muslim sentiment anti chinese sentiment this is all to be directly confronted now finally it's related to the question of neo fascism and so on you see neo fascists are clever because um they understood you know as early as the left did that neo liberalism had failed you know that neo liberalism by basically giving the rich the right to define the world by starving governments of money and therefore creating a permanent condition of austerity and privatization this neo liberalism had deepened social inequality and it produced a kind of hopelessness in world in the world hopelessness which went in a contradictory way aspirations for commodities you know great desire for commodities and at the same time a recognition deep inside the soul that you want to access those that kind of thing creates resentment it creates anger and so on well the neo fascists understood that contradictory relationship to commodities and hope and they manipulated it they basically said we are going to give you the life you always deserved and the way we're going to do it is we're going to go after immigrants we're going to go after minorities etc but they never challenged the structure of capitalism but they they just took resentment and pivoted resentment into hate it's a very you know tried and true method that the neo fascists have used and they're using it now they're trying to pivot resentment and hate people are going to die but blame the chinese you know in india blame the muslims and so on uh, this pivoting is going to happen it's very important that it's directly confronted you know uh, and at the same time we have to build up and show that we have an alternative i mean that's why i think the cuban example is so central that the cubans have provided for us an alternative a very poor country in 1959 their resources stripped away from them were able to create a dignified society this for us even under immense pressure their society is very dignified this for us is exactly what we need to be lifting up the example of cuba the example of china you know that old debate is china restored capitalism is it socialist whatever that debate is moot in my mind you know the chinese are on an experiment they are attempting to build something uh, certainly it's the case that they in the midst of this pandemic suspended the importance of economic growth and put all their resources towards people they put essentially people before profit this is a very instructive lesson of the character of the chinese experiment the chinese experiment in a time of crisis put people ahead of profit and i think that is how i understand the chinese experiment in this time we haven't seen this in other countries i'm going to end with an example um, the pop star rihanna bought i think four or five ventilators to send to her native country of barbados where there's again because of imf pressure and so on um real decline in uh, medical care infrastructure and so on well what does the united states government do it seizes the ventilators you know what does the united states government do to a firm in in germany that's trying to develop you know antiviral vaccines or try to buy it try to use the intellectual property to benefit people inside the united states these are the two parts you know you have a part that says people before profit and people means not just our nationality but the world before profit and the other side that says our people first and then profit and basically profit before our people anyway because trump keeps saying let's get people back to work as quickly as possible regardless of the health outcomes so in a in the bourgeois order it's profit first and then the people of your nationality and the world be damned in the socialist experiment it's people first whether it's your people or the people of the world and profit really not that important and i think that's the two lines and if we're not sharp in our distinction of the two lines i think we might again lose the game to the neo fascists atul how's that thank you so much uh, vijay uh, we are really uh, grateful to you for accepting that and uh, i am also thankful to a lot of participants who are here and who asked questions uh, i'll request every one of you to please subscribe to uh, our youtube channel we'll be also posting this talk with vijay uh, later in the evening today itself and uh, i know a lot of questions i was not able to take it because of the limitation of the time uh, but i can promise you we'll be organizing talks like this again uh, in this lockdown uh, i also request everyone to 
and uh, pray for everyone's safety. Stay safe. Uh, stay strong. Uh, we'll overcome. And uh, I know Cuba, uh, Venezuela, Iran, uh, they are uh, somehow showing us some hope and we all need to uh, be stand with them in solidarity and uh, keep on talking about them. So thank you so much, Vijay. And thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today and uh, listen to the conversations. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.